We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, we're going to continue on in the series, so let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would open your word to us, that you give us eyes to see, hearts to feel, and that you give us hands to put these things into practice. Father, that you would download into us the wisdom of heaven, that you would help us to know the living God, and have discernment. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your amazing grace. I need it just as much today as the first day that I came to know you. Father, I ask that you would help me to speak clearly and boldly your word. Father, we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, as we're, we're going to be reading out of James chapter 3, and we're going to read at length a, a portion of Scripture. Now, I want you to understand, when we read through this in the early church, they would have read through the whole book of James because this is really just a letter. Now, I will admit, this, this letter is near and dear to my heart because when I first came to know the Lord, I got together with my youth pastor, and I was like, where do I start? I, I mean, I didn't know anything. I didn't, if you said, James, I'd be like, who's that? If you said uh, 315, if you said John 316, I'd go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't know chapter, I didn't know verse, I didn't know anything. So I started getting into the book of James, and this is a letter that takes, for people who take a little bit longer to read, like myself, maybe 14, 15 minutes to read. Now, for that younger version of myself, it took about five to six hours because I was like, I don't get this. I don't understand. And so I just, I kept on reading and reading and reading and trying to understand what God was trying to communicate through this letter. Now, in preparation for this, whether you've been, you're trying to learn about Jesus or you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, um, one of the things I did in preparation, I, I want to encourage you to try it out. Um, what I did is I sat down and I read the book of James five times, okay, I just read it straight through, got up, had a cup of coffee, you know, and then came back down, but read it straight through five times. Then after that, read this section that we're going to read here this morning five times. And let me tell you, when you begin to do that, it's like the hyperlinks begin to show up. And you're like, oh, that, and it's connected to that, this connected to that, that's connected to that. But when you read a chapter today, a chapter tomorrow, and then you come back maybe next year, you don't get that experience. So let's read this together, okay? I'm going to read it out loud. You can listen. Sound good? All right. So James, chapter 3, verse 13, he tells us this. He says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it. By living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism, and it is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. 
And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the Scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the Spirit He has placed within us should be faithful to Him. And He gives grace generously, as the Scripture says. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up in honor. Now, in many traditions in, in, in churches this morning, when they do a reading of Scripture like that, they may say something like, this is the Word of God, um, or uh, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Um, but within this, I want you to hear that this is a word that is being spoken to the church. But listen, wherever you are in the journey, you're going to find that, listen, there are problems that happen in the church as well. There are difficulties that happen in the church. But we're going to find that there are different ways of dealing with it, and that's what James is going to speak to. He's going to talk about the fact that, you know, there are wars and fights going on. And, and you might read this and go, what wars and fights? Well, we'll put it up here. There's class war, employment wars, there's church fights, personal wars, at war with ourselves, at war with God. And I am so thankful that 2,000 years after this is written, we don't deal with any of this today, do we? Yeah. Yeah, we, we still struggle with these, don't we? We struggle with the warnings that James gives throughout this book. He, he warns against double-mindedness, dependency on wealth, unrepentant sin, an uncontrollable tongue, faith without fruit, showing partiality, selfish ambition, and wrong motives. Man, that's a struggling church. I'm glad we're so much better than this church. No, we all need grace, don't we? So this morning, we're going to talk about five ways to choose genuine wisdom because I think that uh, James really speaks to this because there is two kinds of wisdom as we will talk about in a moment. But the first point I want you to hear is that we have to acknowledge that not all wisdom is from heaven. And that's exactly what James is saying. He's saying there are two kinds of wisdom. The first kind of wisdom, the wisdom of this world, this is the beware of this wisdom. The second kind of wisdom from heaven, this is the be aware of this. Because we have to be able to make those choices. And so we're going to look very quickly at the bewares, and then we're going to spend a bit more time on the be awares, okay? So we first see of the four bewares of the wisdom of this world, the first one that we see is jealousy, then selfish ambition, boasting, and lying. Ultimately, what we're seeing here is pride. That's what we're seeing. We see people with pride, and, and when you hear selfish ambition, don't just simply think, oh, I can't be ambitious. No, 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 no. There's a difference between having ambition, saying, you know what, I want to start a, a business, or I want to go to school, or you know what, I, 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 want, I want to leave a legacy for my family. These are good, healthy, righteous ambitions. But there are unhealthy ambitions that lead to jealousy, boasting, lying. You've experienced them at some point or another probably in life where somebody, whether it was in school or maybe at your work, they would just assume push you in front of the bus, and then step right over you, right? 
We've all experienced this at some point or another. We've had it where somebody took, like, like you had a great idea, you, you put things out, and somebody else took credit for it. And you wanted to speak up. You're like, but, 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 but you also knew that it just wouldn't look very good at that moment. It would look like you're boasting or something. You're like, no, I'm not boasting. James speaks to this in 3 verse 15. He says, for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Did he really say that? Yes, demonic. That is a hard word. I can deal with earthly. I can even go with unspiritual, but you're going to call this demonic? I, I'm not. James is. So whether you read something like Machiavelli's The Prince, people will even say, that's very Machiavellian. And if you aren't aware of what that means, it's kind of like he is giving advice to kings and he's saying, speak everything that they want to up here with a smile. And then when they turn around, stab them in the back. That is not the wisdom of this kingdom. Not the wisdom of heaven. Or it might even be, I don't have enough time to get into it, but you start looking at the book, The 48 Laws of Power. Or maybe you want to go old school to Sun Tzu, The Art of War. It's not to say that these things don't have any of them in them that we can learn but it's to say, listen, this is not the ethic of the kingdom. This is not how we go about doing things. We want to look to God's word. We want to look to God's wisdom first and foremost. And to go outside of that boundaries, that parameter, to take the wisdom of this world, James makes it really clear. It's demonic. James continues on. He says elsewhere in uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he says, What is causing the quarrels and fighting among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? See, some of it doesn't have to be from demons, the devil. It doesn't have to come from that. Some of it, it's just our human condition, our own brokenness, our own fallenness. He goes on and he says, you don't ask for it. You, you don't have what you want because you don't ask for it. He's saying, listen, you don't even pray about this. You're not even bringing it up to God. You're just doing it all on your own. But you know, he goes on and he says, and even when you do ask, even when you do pray about this in verse 3 and 4, he says, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. Your motives are all wrong. It's not just about praying about it. It's about what is my motive? I remember many years ago, I was listening to, there was a, a minister that I used to listen to on the radio. And I remember he talked about how when he was in school, he wrote a small little piece of paper. He wrote, what is my motive? Because he wanted to begin to ask that. And I thought, that's a great idea. And so I did the same and I put it on my wall. Man, when you begin to actually ask that question of yourself, it can be really tough to hear the truth of what your motive is. I think about things like marriages, family, work, church. I think about all of these things. When we're saying things, when we're presenting them, what's my motive? Like, really, what's my motive? The thing that I hear in my heart and in my mind that I know, but I would never share it with anybody else. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What's my motive? I think back to a time when I was probably about 19 years old. Um, this was early on in my walk with Jesus, and um, I decided, you know what, um, I'm going to go with my buddy John over to Windsor, Canada. Now, I'm from Michigan, and if you're from Michigan, you probably know what was in Windsor, Canada in the 90s. Gambling. 
There were casinos there. You went to Windsor, Canada for that. And, and me and my friend John, we went there. And here's the thing. I was going to do great that day. I was going to do phenomenal. Why? Because in ninth grade, I had been in Mr. Stoltz's algebra class, and he taught us about variables and everything else. And so I knew what I was doing. I was going to do fantastic. And I let God know what my motive was. I said, God, if you'll bless me, I'll bless you. I'm very generous that way. Needless to say, he owns it all already, and he doesn't need my help. We'll just say I was a young believer. But in the midst of this, I found myself at, at, a, at a table and losing 40 bucks in the first five to 10 minutes. And let me tell you, 40 bucks was a lot more, okay? I know, I feel really old in this moment. But it was a lot more. And I'm sitting there going, I'm making a minimum wage, so I spent the next three hours winning it back on the slots. Not the greatest idea after that, but, but I learned my lesson. I went, I'm not going to waste my time or my money. I've, I've learned, I've learned my lesson. So what's your motive? What's your motive in, in your marriage? What's your motive with, with your kids? What's your motive in this world, in the church, at your work? Because true motives always show up in actions. They always show up in actions. And this leads to the second way to choose genuine wisdom. Recognize selfish ambition and humility are worlds apart. Jesus said it this way. You can't serve God. And he said mammon, money. And within this I would say, you can't serve God and fill in the blank. Whatever it is, maybe it's not money for you. Maybe it is selfish ambition. Maybe it's power. Maybe it's just being right. Not necessarily that you're right, but that you're right and everybody needs to agree with you, right? Right. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> so here are some traits that we do want to emulate. We've talked about the you know, be wares. Now let's talk about the be awares because moments are going to happen in your life, much like they do in my life, where whether it's you're raising the kids and you know what? You are in the right, but you're going about it the wrong way. You begin to have to ask that question, what is my motive? Because the kids were wrong and you began right in correcting them. But then that thing became a lecture, right? And inside, you think to yourself, no, 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 no. My lectures are much, they're much straightforward. They're, they're not as long as my dad's, but let me tell you, it's still a lecture. And I know it because there's that moment, especially the dads in the room. We've had that moment where we're instructing our kids and we think in our head, I should stop. This is going way long. And you can usually tell because at first you've got their attention and then there's that glazed over look, right? Just that glazed over look. And, and if you've never seen this, you've probably felt it yourself when you were being lectured. Or you think about in your marriage. It's amazing how spouses have such amazing memories sometimes. <laughs> I can see that there's no risk of Alzheimer's or dementia in this room. But we bring up things that have nothing to do with what we're talking about because we want to win. And I'm here to tell you that sometimes you can win and you can completely lose. Sometimes winning feels like losing. So let's take a look at some of the traits to actually emulate. We're given nine be aware traits of the wisdom from heaven. And that's the wisdom. That's genuine wisdom. And the first one is humility. Now, everything that I say up to this point, if, if you don't get that you're going to have to have humility, everything to come next isn't going to connect. You have to start with humility. You have to start 
with humility before God. And humility, ultimately, it's a freedom from pride. It's a freedom from pride. It's saying, God, I know that you have my best interest at heart, and so I'm going to bend my knee, and I am going to listen to you, because I know that you know what's best. So we start with humility, and that pours over into another trait, which is purity, being pure, peace, the opposite of pride, and, and all these things ultimately is going to bring some peace instead of selfish ambition, peace, gentleness, willingness to yield, merciful. Being merciful is huge. Jesus said it this way. He said, if you aren't willing to give mercy, if you're not willing to give grace, you're not going to receive it. But you can't give what you don't have, can you? Now, this isn't to say, if you didn't forgive that person, you're going straight to hell. No. But you do have to ask the question. If I'm not willing to give grace, if I'm not willing to give mercy, have I ever really experienced it? I can't give what I don't have. Another one is good fruit. Another trait of the wisdom from heaven is good fruit. Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am, the bran- I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remain in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We can do nothing. We can't produce any good fruit without being connected with Jesus first. Now, does that mean that you've never done anything good? No, I'm sure that there's some good things, but Paul makes it really clear. All the good that we ever do outside of Christ It's like filthy rags. And I could go into that further, but I don't have time. But another trait of the wisdom from heaven is there's no favoritism of any kind. And there is sincerity. Now, for those of you who count the six love languages as sarcasm, I'm sorry. It's it's not a love language, okay? But understand, in a world of pride and self-promotion, where the individual is the center, where it's all about you, Jesus shows us another way. And that falls into the third way to choose genuine wisdom. Walk with Jesus and the traits of His kingdom. If you want wisdom from heaven, if you want genuine wisdom, it's going to come through that walk with Christ. It's going to be through walking and living through life with a living God. James continues on in verse 7 and 8. He says, So humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. See, this is really about loyalty, isn't it? When we talk about humility, we're talking about just this. So humble yourself before God. I like how the NIV puts it. It says, submit yourself then to God. We don't like that word submit, do we? We don't like the idea of it, but, but oftentimes I think it's because we feel like when we hear the word submission or submit, it, in our mind, we translate it as doormat. Just fall down on the ground, or it might even be um, uh, self-abasement. Like, I'm just supposed to, I got to be mean to myself and everything. That's not what submission is. It's not what, when when, when we read in God's Word about submission, submitting to one another out of reverence for the Lord, it's consider others better than yourselves. It's like a friend of mine, I, I think I've shared it before, a friend of mine, Brian and I, we once had an argument with each other about who was smarter no, you're smarter, Brian. No, you are. No, you are. I love these kinds of arguments. I feel so good at the end of them, don't you? He really is a lot smarter than me, though. I'm not kidding. He's brilliant. But in any case, it says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. Now, you may not, this is one of those hyperlinks where you're going to have to go back to chapter 1 because... James says, listen, 
when you're tempted, don't say that God is tempting you. Notice he says when, not if. When you come under temptation, don't say that God's doing it. And here it's saying resist the devil. It's pointing the way to say, listen, God's not doing this. Let me tell you who it is. It's either you working in your flesh, in the human condition, in your own brokenness, your own fallenness, in your own sinfulness, or it's the devil. It's demonic. And within this, he says, the way that we deal with this, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, in my life, this has at times looked something like this. Um, I was under temptation. Now, understand, temptation itself, and I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but you need to hear it very clearly. Temptation in and of itself is not sin. What you do with it is or can be. Everybody in here, we're all tempted in different ways. And as a friend says, I won't look down at you for what you struggle with if you don't look down at me for what I struggle with. In fact, I won't look down at you either way, whether you do or not. We all struggle. It's the human condition. It goes back to the very beginning. But when I come to a place of, you know, I'm under temptation, um, I've literally had moments where I've said, all right, God, I am choosing to submit to you right now. And I've had moments, I kid you not, where suddenly I'm like, wow, that all went away. That was awesome. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but I have had that happen where I just submit myself to God. I'm literally telling Him, I'm submitting to you. I'm humbling myself. I'm coming before you, Father, and now I'm under your reign. I'm under your control. I'm under your authority. Another thing that I love to do, I love if I come under attack from the enemy and I'm being tempted and I'm struggling, and I know someone else who struggles with the same stuff. You know what I do? I pray for them. I pray for other people in the church. I pray for other people in the body of Christ. I even pray for people who are outside the body of Christ. Because I look at it this way. If there's warfare going on, and there is people, there is spiritual warfare going on, and if that is true, then guess what? If the enemy is going to come at me, I'm going to help a whole bunch of other people along the way. And I found that as I pray for other people, the enemy's like, whoa, hold on, I better, I got to leave this one alone because um, yeah, they're making a little bit of ruckus everywhere else around here. But we first have to recognize our need. Sometimes when it comes to submitting yourself to God, maybe you're not struggling with that. Maybe you've, you've got it all figured out and you're doing wonderfully and that's great. But you have brothers and sisters in Christ around you who they're struggling. They're struggling like, like I did early on in my walk. I remember that there was a time when I was disconnected with the church. I didn't know where my Bible was. I was a very sloppy roommate. And so my uh, friend and roommate, Dave, he took and did the smartest thing he could. He went down on the ground and took my side of the room and swept it all underneath my bed. That included my Bible. <laughs> Couldn't find it for a while until I cleaned things up. But in the midst of it, I had a new roommate. And this is at a Christian co-op, a men's Christian co-op. And as I was there, this guy, Jim, he was new to the co-op. And he said, hey, do you want to come to church with me? I said, you know what? I have not, I, I've not connected with the church in a while. I would love to do so. And when I did, this was the shocking thing. We got into that little VW Golf, drove over there. And as we got over, I went, oh, apparently we're part of the same church, huh? It's a really big church. <laughs> I was home. But he was the one who had actually reached out. You have people in your life right now that you know have not connected with the church, not reconnected with the church. Maybe they're still going to churches online, and there's nothing wrong with that for a time. But listen, when I look at Scripture, and it talks about 
loving one another, bearing one another's burdens, forgiving one another. The one another's don't happen in our apartments and our, in our homes alone. They happen in community. And for some people, I understand, maybe it's, well, I've, there's work going on. Become part of a life group. But for most, they just need an invitation. This is where like Christmas, Easter, we're like, hey, we'll make it really simple. We'll give you the invitations. And more often than not, I think it's like four out of five times the people will actually gather with the church. And even if they say, oh, I'm not, I, I'm not going to be in town. Great. How about after? How about before? I want to encourage you in that. But the fourth way to choose genuine wisdom, it's just simple. We just went through it. Humble yourself, resist the devil, come near to God. Understand, this is a promise. You come near to God, God will come near to you. If you're sitting there going, man, I just feel like God's not as close. Here's the promise. Come near to God. I saw a meme more recently. It said, I just, I just wish that I could hear God audibly. Would you like to hear God audibly? Absolutely. So what you do is you go over here to God's Word and you read it out loud. Seems really simple, doesn't it? Sometimes it's not enough to look at it. Sometimes I need to hear it. And then I need to live it. And that's where the rubber meets the road. I need to live it with other imperfect people just like me. Because we all need grace. James goes on in verse 9 and 10. He says, let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up in honor. Again, there's that humility. I like how Paul, an early follower of Jesus, says it in 2 Corinthians 7, 10. He says, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. It's the idea, it, it, the way that I think about it is, I got in trouble. I'm sorry that I got caught, right? That's worldly sorrow sometimes. I'm sorry I got caught. There's no true repentance really. And this leads to our fifth way to choose genuine wisdom. Godly sorrow leads to genuine wisdom from heaven. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is what changes everything. When we come to God that way, it makes a change. It also makes a change when we come to one another and we say, you know what? I was so wrong. I'm so sorry. Even going to our kids. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You may never have gotten an apology from your parents, but that doesn't suddenly take you off that you don't have to do that. Amongst the body of Christ, within marriages. Humility matters. So we've seen these five ways to genuine wisdom. We've seen that we need to acknowledge that not all wisdom is from heaven. We need to recognize selfish ambition and humility are worlds apart. That we walk with Jesus and the traits of his kingdom, that we humble ourselves, resist the devil, come near to God. And finally, godly sorrow leads to genuine wisdom from heaven. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Paul says elsewhere in Colossians 2, 1 and 2, he says, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. If you've wondered if anybody's praying for you, Jesus prayed for you, Paul prayed for you, you don't know the countless amount of people who have prayed for you.
he goes on and he says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want wisdom? You want true wisdom, genuine wisdom. It is found in Christ Jesus alone and in his plan. We all have our own plans. But unless the Lord builds it, we're all plotting in vain. It's been said before, man makes his plans and God laughs. You've probably heard that before. I know it's a cliche. But it's so true sometimes, isn't it? It's so true. And I want you to know that you may be in a place where you're like, hey, I'm good, John. Great. Pray for the rest of us. Pray for me. Because we're struggling. I pray for you. We pray for you as a church. For each one another. We pray and understand. Listen, even in your family, I want to encourage you. Be praying for the generations to come. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. It might be in our lifetime. I hope it is. But I'll tell you what, I pray for my grandkids, my great-grandkids. I pray for a thousand generations because I know that the God of heaven is already there. Right now, he's there. And so when we're praying, God's like, oh, I got that. I know very few of the prayers that have come to me or come to God, I should say, on my behalf over the years. But I guarantee there's got to be some from generations before. And in God's word, I know that there are. Even if I don't feel like anybody's praying for me, I know that Paul did, and more importantly, I know that the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, prayed for us, for you, for me, before we deserved it. So when we come to a what now, God, moment, I want to make it really simple. I will choose heavenly wisdom today by fill in the blank. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're dealing with. But what I do know is this. Make it practical. Don't just say, I need to be more peaceful. How? How do you need to be more peaceful? Maybe it's not yelling. Maybe it's I'm going to remove myself from the situation for a moment until I can calm down and then we'll come back and we'll talk again. It may be some other form of humility, but without humility, I don't think you're going to get genuine wisdom from heaven because even at the beginning of James, he says, you need wisdom, ask God who gives generously. But you must believe and not doubt. When God gives you an answer, from his holy word. When God gives you an answer from a brother or sister in Christ, when God gives you an answer, I didn't hear that. No, you got to believe and not doubt. You got to walk the path. So let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us to walk the path, that you would help us to walk with you, that you would help us to talk with you. And Father, that you would help us to measure our motives against you, perfection. To come to your word in humility, to say, God, search me, know me, see if there's anything offensive in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We ask for all this, we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.